Thoth Hermes podcast. Welcome to the world of the Western esoteric tradition. Friends and listeners, and welcome to a new episode of the Thoth Hermes podcast. My name is Rudolf, and I am, as every week, your host. This is episode number 20 of season 8. We are closing to the end, 24 episodes in this season, and for more to go after this one here today. And today, We go to Europe's far north, to Finland, and we will meet Vesa Iti and a book that he and a friend of his have written, which is called Lightbringers of the North. And, uh, well, it's about Finnish occultism. More about that and why and how a little later in this show. And I hope you're going to enjoy this. It's really A great country up there, great people and great occultism. I am very happy that you have returned to my show. Uh, Many of you do every week and it's great to have you back. And if you're here for the first time, maybe because you are from Finland and have thought, hmm, I have to have a look into that. Um, Great. Welcome. Tervetuloa, as the Finnish people say. And uh, welcome on the show. And But of course, if you're not from Finland, you're just as welcome here today. So it's great to have you back and to have you with us. Go to the website, if you have not yet done so, to the website thoughthermes.com. T-H-O-C-H-E-R-M-E-S dot com. And you'll find, well, this show, of course, you probably have already found it. And uh, you will find all the other shows, 130 four i think there must be by now that you can listen to at this very moment so lots of things to do if it's your summer holiday or your winter holiday maybe you're from down under we have many listeners from south africa australia and japan and many other countries on the other side of the planet that they then where i am from so um you listen you have time to listen to all those previous shows please do there are real gems among them Every single episode is interesting to listen to. So go there, listen, and enjoy. Right, and while you're at the website, you'll find several other things that I should point out to you. First of all, there is a feedback possibility. And I like feedback. Feedback um, for this show, for your impressions, feedback on criticism, on ideas. If you like it, I like all your replies to us. So on the website, you have either a voicemail form. Just click on the right side. There is a tab for a voicemail that you can send to me. Or you have the contact form as on most most of the websites. You just fill that in. Or you just click on the email info at thoughthermes.com. If you don't want to go to the website to send me feedback, you have Facebook and Twitter, of course. And on the website, there are also other things. There is that, you know, that famous button starting with P. There is one starting with P, the other starting with D. P for Patreon and D for donation. Right, got you. So, Please become a patron of this show. We need you to support this show. We need you to maintain this show and to do a wonderful season nine. And thanks to those of you who are already patrons, who have already joined us as patrons. It's great to have you as supporters of this show. Wonderful. And as I said, we really need you. We need you to support us. And... um, so you can start your donation by one dollar per show that's the, that's for patreons or more per show it's up to you to choose that but it starts at one dollar or if you prefer a one-off donation we are very happy about i am very happy about that as well would be great to do that for us okay 
And um, third thing I wanted to point out on the website while you're there, you have on the top of the first page, on the homepage, you have that link to Kaikobad Radio. If you have not gone to Kaikobad Radio yet, please do. It's my internet radio 24-7. And it brings to you the best of the podcasting on the internet, on the Western occult tradition. And if uh, there is a show that you miss, uh, please let me know. Maybe I don't know it yet and uh, point it out to me. And uh, has already happened Then, among the 25 creators that are present there for the moment, there are a couple who have been told to me about, told me about by you, the listeners. So Taiko Bad Radio, it's absolutely free. No donations needed there. And um, it's the content from, from all over the world on Western esoteric tradition. Right, so time for some music, isn't it? Time for some music. And well, you guessed it, this week the music is from Finland, indeed. And the best, the, the first uh, piece of music, uh, by the way, this group will bring two, uh, two uh, pieces to us here today. The, f the group is called Korpikladi, and that means the clan from the backwood. Korpi is a hidden wood. Korpikladi, and their first title that we are going to hear now is called Lempo. And Lempo, as Korpikladi tell us, is a fiery god of fertility. And this song is about the spells designated to Lempo in order to guarantee a success in one's personal love life. So should maybe listen to that, shouldn't you? Right, so listen to Lempo and uh, be surprised by Finnish music. As always, you will be surprised by the Finns. As I said, a great people and wonderful music they do. Uh, it's this type of music, but there's also classical music and we hear a bit of that later in the show. But now it's Korpiklani and Lem.
Lembo, the fiery god from Finland, and Korpi Klani, the group from Finland, sang about him or to him, and I hope you were inspired about that fiery god who will help with your love questions. Lightbringers of the North, that's the title of a book that is being released this week, actually, by Inner Traditions. And the subtitle is Secrets of the Occult Tradition of Finland. And there is also another sentence on the top of the title page, which says, The light will come from Finland. And that was being said or written by no less than Madame Blavatsky. So she must know, mustn't she? So um, really, this book is a great book that has been compiled and written by Pertu Häkkinen and Vesaiti. And Vesaiti is the guy I'm talking here today, um, to here today. And um, well, uh, he has co-authored this book with Pertu Häkkinen and but uh, sadly, Pertu, he uh, was killed in an accident uh, a couple of years ago. So um, we will hear also about that, about that sad story, but mostly about the book and how it came together and what it contains. And we get much more background information about the Finnish occult world from Vesaiti. And that Finnish occult world is so really vivid and interesting and very different from what you would expect. So I hope you're going to really enjoy that show. And usually I would now read you something from the book, but I decided otherwise because I asked Vesaiti the question, how come that uh, this book did come into being? And of course, he told me the story. But then I thought I should also ask someone else, um, the guy who made it happen, the guy at Inner Traditions and People who listen to this show regularly, you know him already. It's Jan Graham, because Jan Graham, he was on the show about his translation of the Bavarian Illuminati book, that big, big, big junk book, great book. And uh, Jan, I asked Jan, well, why did you, because he's responsible at Inner Traditions for the choice of books, why did you pick that title and pick that book to be translated and produced in English after it had been written in Finnish language first. And, well, he gave me the following answer. Jan, tell us all about it. Hi, Rudolf. That's a good question. Why did I decide to acquire the manuscript that became Lightbringers of the North? There's a bit of a backstory to it, as I had seen it shortly after its initial publication in Finland when the late Pertu Hakkinen sent me a translation of the table of contents and a short sample at the recommendation of Aki Cedarberg, whose journey in the Kali Yuga we also published. Unfortunately, finding a reliable Finnish translator proved impossible here, and with Pertu's tragic death, the project seemed doomed. However, during this time, Pertu's co-author, Vesa, was diligently translating the entire book, and when he sent it to me, it bore out all my expectations, and I felt immediately that this was a book Inner Traditions had to publish. It is difficult to describe all the various things that go into the decision to acquire a manuscript, and hindsight distorts things quite a bit. For me personally, what inspires me to recommend a book for our list is primarily based on resonance, the way a book resonates for me. Andre Breton wrote a preface for a book by Carol Kupka on Australian Aboriginal art that best describes the resonance, the kind of resonance I like to establish with the book. In this preface, entitled First Hand, Breton writes, Love, first of all. There will always be time later to interrogate ourselves about what we love enough, leaving ourselves ignorant of nothing. Before, as after this inquiry, it is intimate resonance that counts the most. Without its presence at the outside, we will be almost irremediably dispossessed, and nothing of what can be learned can replace it if it is lost along the way. The resonance of this book remains intact, and I still definitely feel it when leafing through the finished copy. The subject matter of this book interested me for many reasons, but two in particular. One, it offers insights into what may well be one of the most unusual countries in Europe, Finland. It is not properly part of Scandinavia, yet its presence has been a constant theme in Scandinavian history. In his endorsement, Don Webb mentions the scary old Finn that is a trope in Scandinavian ghost stories. 
But this scary figure has deep roots. In his Heimskringler, Snorri Storluson writes of the enchanted reindeer hide coat that one of the slayers of St. Olaf obtained from Finnish magicians. When struck, it only released smoke, and unhindered by his enemy's weapons, Thorir the dog was able to join his comrades in dispatching the king. Finland is also singular for having a language that is not related to the Germanic and Russian languages spoken by its neighbors. This finno Ugric tongue is now thought by some to originate in what is now Mongolia, and there are clear similarities visible between the shamanism of the Sami people and that of Siberians and Mongolians. There is then the fact that, with the Kalevala, it has its own body of myth that stands apart from, say, the Germanic North mythos or the pagan Slavic traditions of its immediate neighbors. This is just a quick snapshot of what I find particularly intriguing about Finland and the unique perspective it brings to the occult traditions that have evolved there, whether homegrown or imported. The other aspect is the concept of a culture as defined by Genesis P. Orridge and developed extensively by Swedish author Carl Abrahamson. Genesis defined this as the concealed dialogue between every level of popular cultural forms and magical conclusions. It's truly revelatory of how deeply occult ideas on the margins of a given culture have influenced that culture as a whole. As is visible elsewhere, this book offers ample evidence of a remarkable number of different magical paths and hermetic disciplines practiced over the last century in Finland. To a certain extent, this is a postmodern phenomenon in which occult ideas contend with each other like stores competing in a shopping mall. But I also feel that this multivalent output could be the herald of a great return to the time of the pantheistic cultures before the monotheistic cults brutally established their dominance. Minutes. Those days when religious tolerance acknowledged that every city had its own gods, and syncretism was not a sign of corruption and decadence, but a sign of spiritual strength. Cut to the chase. A book like Lightbringers is a fa faithful and fascinating overview of the enormous range of occult activity in Finland over the last century and the extremely colorful figures that were engaged in it. I'm more than happy the way the final book bettered my most opti optimistic expectations. I could follow with more superlatives, but really, just read the book. Like all the best books, it is truly capable of speaking for itself. Thank you so much, John Graham from Inner Traditions, to tell us about the genesis of that book. Uh, very interesting. And, um, well, now we know all about it, and we are ready for the interview. So, without further ado, let's go, let's go to Finland. Let's meet Vesa Iti and speak about that book, Lightbringers of the North, Secrets of the Occult Tradition of Finland. Enjoy. Here comes the interview. This episode of the Source Hermes podcast is, um, well, to me, it is very special because we are touching here on a subject that for some reason is dear to my heart. I don't know why I have always, always loved Finland. And maybe it's also um, somehow because, because I have had a previous life there I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> but in any case we are going to talk about Finland and a book that has recently been released by Inner Traditions very recently actually in those days that we speak um, Light Bringers of the North Secrets of the Occult Tradition of Finland and who would have guessed that an American publisher would publish a book about occultism in Finland. And I'm very happy to welcome here on the Thought Hermit podcast today, um, one of the authors, one of the two authors of that book, Vesa Ilti, who from, speaks to us from his home country, Finland. Vesa Hyvailta, and it's very nice to have you here on the Thought Hermit podcast. Vielen Dank, Rudolf. Uh, yes, thank you. It's an honor to be here in your great podcast. Uh, thank you. We're stopped now talking in each other's <laughs> languages. Otherwise, that's going to be horrible, <laughs> at least for my end. <laughs> um, yeah, Vesa, um, you have been co-author of that book. And um, first of all, before we go into detail and about you and about the other author, um, what 
gave a you the idea because if i get it right the book was first published in your country by another publisher of course by a finnish mm -hmm. publisher and um, uh, what gave you the idea to publish that book why do you think it was necessary to do that and secondly what was the reason in your opinion that then suddenly an american publisher would speak about Finnish, not Nordic, Finnish occultism. Um, that's quite a surprise, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Well, the book came out uh, in Finnish uh, in 2015. It was published by this uh, Mike Kustanus. And uh, the idea for the book came from Perto. Uh, he approached me. There was this uh, book fair in Helsinki where I was talking about uh, my translation of uh, Jeanne de Saltzman's The Reality of Being and Berto approached me after that and says that uh, hey I'd have an idea for a book I'd like to write with you like uh, and he presented the basic idea that we'd uh, cover uh, well the, basically the occult esoteric history of Finland roughly from our time of the country's independence and uh, I was like hmm well let me think I wasn't very enthusiastic in the beginning about the whole idea he needed to Berto needed to warm me up a bit for the whole idea but we talk about it and uh, eventually I thought that well actually this is a this is a great idea and it looks like we have a great chemistry we get well along we have a similar kind of sense of humor and all over approach to the whole whole subject. Uh, Bertu came from back then, he was, um, uh, his background, uh, his studies, he had studied philosophy. I was more from the direction of uh, comparative religions and um, I had uh, I had been pra also a practitioner of uh, some, some um, from some angle to uh, es esotericism. And uh, Berto was familiar with my previous uh, writings and translations and what I have been doing and he liked the whole idea. And then, well, we wrote the book. Uh, it was uh, uh, it was a combination of uh, earlier articles and research we had done and uh, absolutely fresh stuff that we did during that about a year plus year for the book. And uh, well, it turned out to be a um, big success because uh, funnily enough uh, there hadn't been such a like a popular history book about this subject uh, here in Finland of course there had been uh, radio programs TV programs academic studies uh, uh, books about uh, special like uh, groups and uh, all of this but no no single work that would have put within the same covers a uh, general overview of the of the topic. So uh, there was a kind of a need for it, for the book and it became a pretty big success. The first print was uh, sold out less, less than two weeks. The second print went uh, wow. fairly quickly into printers and, uh, and uh, it inspired occult walking tours in Turku and Helsinki and one theater play in northern part of the country and stuff like that. And it was covered very well in Finnish media. And uh, uh, it's now in its fourth Finnish printing and there is audio book too. And so it was a, quite a big success. And uh, Bertu was after that, like from the very, very beginning after the Finnish uh, edition had come out at a we need to get this also in English. Like it was a big, big, important thing for him. Uh, back then, I was more like, the, hmm, like let's see. I had other things going on that uh, I don't right now have time for this. Like uh, maybe a bit later, but I translated like a one sample chapter that Bertu then used to approach um, some places. One of them being inner traditions. Like he made the initial contact to inner traditions uh, to John John Graham actually, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, and sure. um, who was on my show a few yeah, weeks ago. Yeah, great guy, absolutely yeah, great yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He wrote this great book about Bavarian mm -hmm. Illuminati, and um, exactly. yeah, and. Um, 
And um, um, because we didn't get grants or didn't have a funding for like getting the book translated by some somebody who was a professional translator, and Perto knew that of course that I had translated something, some books before, so he kindly nudged me uh, like uh, pretty often that I hey because you translated earlier, maybe you could translate our book too. So we wouldn't need to pay for anybody for that. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that's a great idea, but I'm busy right now. So we need to look if, if we find somebody to do it for us. But uh, it didn't happen. And then unfortunately in 2018, pretty much um, a month from now in, in August 12, um, Berto passed away in a tragic bicycle accident. And uh, mm. and um, that uh, that partly affected uh, my approach to the whole thing. Uh, after I got some things done that I was working with and wanted to do, I I felt that uh, uh, well, of course, it's a great idea to get the book also in English, but. Uh, then I got this feeling also that it's a matter of honor to my friend and his wish about this yeah. thing because it was a really big thing for Perto and he often referred to our book as a big part of our great work to use Alistair Crowley's term. He, he used it. Okay. I, I <laughs> Alistair didn't. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he, he, he called our, our book many, many times that and, um, so I had this feeling that uh, this needs to be done. And funnily enough, uh, Bertu came um, to my dreams even many times uh, and reminded me that uh, this is important. We need to get this finished. Okay. So I, I got also also in that mm -hmm. way like this a feeling that uh, I need to I need to get this done. Like it was such a big thing for for Bertu and. Uh, I like the idea too, but um, it needs to be done uh, to also to honor what he had done and, um, and his wish. And um, in general, it was a great idea. So um, Perto had made this uh, connection already, I think around 2015, 2016, to Inner Traditions uh, on John Graham. And I contacted him. Uh, again and we started to discuss like uh, okay how about this thing are you still interested and um, he was they were and uh, it went from there I started to translate the book I sent sample chapters and um, when I guess about how I was halfway um, I get green light that okay we are going to publish this and uh, then the project went on from there and uh, well now we are now we are here that uh seven years now seven, here, seven years later it's getting out uh, from from american exactly. publishing and in <laughs> these days in these days that we are talking and publishing this interview it's actually finally coming yeah. out uh, you were talking about Pertu, of course Pertu, Pertu Hekin and the full name i have to mention him once yeah. because uh, um he's the he's one of the two authors of that book um let's talk about the, about the two of you i have with what you just said i have a couple of more yeah. questions about about the, the background to that but let's talk about the two of you first maybe let's start with you as it's maybe easier to talk about mm. yourself in the first place um uh, do you want to tell us well as much as you want um, tell us what what is your background in the field i mean you mentioned you were also a practitioner um are you are you also an academic in the field are you a writer in general what's what's your background when you when you uh, when you approach that all right um well i've been involved with a few like esoteric groups since my late teens um Mm. And um, um, well, currently I'm quite a private person when it comes to these things, but I can say that uh, um, since like uh, 2001 or so, uh, it's on and off, I've been involved with the, the Burjev group in, in Finland. And okay. um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, being like a meditation is part of my regular practice too. So I have this kind of. Um, uh, personal personal yeah. uh, practice context for my practice yeah. in, in addition to that I um, I have a master of arts from the Turku University in comparative religions 
and I did my master's mm -hmm. uh, about the subject that dealt with, um, well, Guru GFID, as it was about the senior uh, senior member of the local Turku group of, uh, of uh, well, Guru GF group. So I had that too. I've, uh, okay. I've written and translated uh, some books uh, related to the uh, subjects. Uh, I guess most uh, notable of them, or what I would like to mention is, uh, well, I've translated Stephen Flowers and uh, Crystal Dawn's Carnal Alchemy, and, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, Gianni de Saltzman's um, uh, The Reality of Being, that of course lands into the Gurdjieff context. So um, I'm a bit kind of um, have my feet in um, both both areas. Like I, I have been doing things as a practitioner, and um, I have studied in the university these things and too. Observe, observing yeah, as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, what about Pertu? What was his background? I mean, it was a very sad story that you just told yeah. us uh, with this accident that happened two years ago and uh, struck many people, yes. I know. Um, so what what was his background? Was he practitioner as well? Was he a pure academic? What's, what's his, as far as you can tell, what was his background? Yeah, well, when Pertu approached me in 2014 about the idea, he emphasized that... Uh, he comes more a kind of from a, just kind of a, from the angle of an observer, and he told that he has this background that he um, did his masters masters of um, uh, master of arts degree about um, the ontology of substance and the question of individuality in Spinoza's metaphysics. So Berto has a, this kind okay, of a, well. <laughs> this kind of a background and he emphasized that he is not like inside of uh, any group or he's not like a, he's just curious in general and uh, human consciousness mm. and all these kind of uh, well, occult esoteric topics uh, has interest him for a long long time but as our friendship um, deepened and uh, our project uh, went forward uh, Berto became more a bit more uh, insider he found his own like a Angle to to have a more personal approach to these things. Uh, uh, if I'm uh, I'm pretty private about these things. Perto was even more, and I, and I, and I oh, respect sure, yeah. his uh, approach. And leave it leave it at that. But uh, let's say that Perto's approach uh, deepened and got more personal. So it wasn't just this kind of academic observer anymore. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, but thank you for telling us. But I. I and all our listeners who are practitioners, most of them themselves do, of course, understand the privacy, yeah. privacy yeah. About, <laughs> about that question. That's normal. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, now, uh, you were mentioning and I found that also when I read the book, very interesting. As I said, I know a bit about Finland and I want to underline uh, that maybe people who first take that book and see Lightbringers of the Norse, they think it's another book about Norse magic or whatever. It is not mm. at all. Uh, it is re really a story, as you just said, of occultism and esotericism in Finland since even a bit before it became yeah, independent, right, right uh, in that transition right. to independency. Uh, just for uh, information's sake, uh, Finland became independent in 1917, yes. if yes. I'm right. So the story is a bit over 100 years old, but this starts a little bit earlier than yeah. that in the book. And um, when you said it, uh, there were radio shows or our radio shows in Finland or TV shows about the subject there are books and the book when it came out in Finnish immediately was sold out and this made me very curious and I wanted to ask you about that and um, what situation what position does do the occult arts like I like to mm -hmm. call them um, have in Finland today because um, I mean I wouldn't see in Austria somebody have interest in a book on occultism in Austria today <laughs> or maybe even the last hundred years, even though there is quite an interesting story, maybe more before 1930 than, than afterwards. But um, but I, I don't see uh, 2000 books being sold on that in Austria. Why 
What is it about Finland that makes people interested? Is there such an interest? Where does it come from? Good question. Um, well, Finland, of course, has this, um, let me look back into the history, this reputation that this is a place where people somehow have a special relationship to magic and there has been like a very skilled, exceptionally um, skilled um, people in magic. And um, it, you know, the history goes mm -hmm quite far back when it comes to historical mentions of this. Uh, so there is this kind of aura around this area of the world. But uh, what it's uh, now, uh, um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. It's just like there has been this kind of uh, interest to these subjects uh, in general for quite some time now. I think it's a kind of uh, in a boom. If there was a big boom like in the late 60s, 70s, like uh, when it was in the world in general, there was this uh, hippie age, age of Aquarius and, and all of these things coming going on it, uh, was here too and elsewhere in the world. Um, And then there was like 80s, 90s was more quiet. And then I think uh, general interest started to build up. Now it's like a very popular. And there is, of course, this concept of culture, like how we can see these themes, occultism, esotericism in popular culture. It's uh, more and more present, like uh, in music, of course, there's lots of musicians who at least flirt with esoteric occult ideas, symbols, or all of that. And in, in literature, there are writers who use these themes and, and, and so, and um, uh, also like uh, in theater, I mentioned, uh, there's been interest in other uh, art exhibitions dealing with the topic. And so uh, for some reason, there is quite big popular interest to in these Of course, the um, spectrum of how serious it is, like, is it just for like a entertainment entertainment, or is there like a serious personal involvement? Uh, that varies a lot, of course. But I, I would also say that there is a quite big uh, interest from those people who are seriously interested nowadays, like the, these occult groups, esoteric groups that are active nowadays in Finland. They might not be so big in number, but um, there is some like a serious uh, involvement for for sure. Um, so yeah, that's the that's the situation now. Yeah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I know the situation in Freemasonry, funny enough, uh, a bit in Finland, uh, just to, for my personal involvement in Freemasonry, in international Freemasonry. And um, there, in the Finnish situation, as far as I know it, um, is triple influence. It's influenced a lot by American influences, by the traditional um, American type of Freemasonry, American English type of Freemasonry. But there's, of course, also the Swedish mm -hmm. influence, which is historically quite comprehensible. Mm -hmm. And another another influence uh, which is less obvious and less uh, strong also, uh, but also historical, is a Russian influence. So uh, um, uh, do you think that this same, maybe not the American, but The, the history of Finland, which has always oscillated between Sweden and Russia before it became independent, um, does this double influence, uh, did, did this create a special interest in, in things magical? Is there a lot of natural magic background there? Or uh, can, you, can you see something that came out of that maybe? Hmm. Well, our geographical position is, of course, interesting. We are kind of, kind of between east and west. Like we have this uh, huge yeah. uh, border with uh, Russia uh, on the eastern side, and then we are uh, uh, on the other side and south. There is there is Europe. We are kind of uh, historically. Well, we've been under, under the rule of Sweden and uh, then for a shorter period uh, of Russia uh, before becoming independent in 1917. So, of course, we've been culturally between this kind of uh, two worlds, if, if, if you want. This has certainly affected the uh, landscape, the culture, and uh, given its flavor to many things, like, a, like a, you mentioned too, And then there is, of course, our own, like uh, this uh, 
when it comes to elements that are, you know, like are, are unique to Finnish uh, esoteric rock art landscape, um, is our kind of a mm. folklore, folkloristic background, uh, the folkloristic materials, and um, and uh, like a. Um, mm, yeah, like a one central source uh, in the history of Finnish esotericism are the uh, materials of the folkloristic archives, well, things that deal with folk beliefs, myths, supernatural beings, and so forth. And uh, we have quite good uh, archives of stuff. And there are, in addition to our national epic Kalevala, which has been a big influence for many, many, many oh, yeah. esotericists. Uh, there's other other important uh, works too, like uh, Christfried Ganander's uh, uh, Mythologia Fennica that was written in the 18th century and other works like that. So this uh, kind of a folkloristic uh, background that comes from a pre-Christian kind of a culture uh, is there too too and and, and, and uh, people have yeah, a very yeah. heavily drawn inspiration from it like we can see it in our book too like um, Pekka Ervast um, who is the person of the first chapter he was very uh, very much in, uh, influenced by um, Kalevala and, and uh, kind of folk materials yeah. involved but it didn't stop there like uh, as decades went on and still today um, there are um, individuals and groups that are are inspired by these more folkloristic um, materials and um, it's some, something that um, well it's of course uniquely Finnish like uh, this is something that doesn't influence for example a, a Swedish occultist or, or so in such a way yeah, that's of course. Uh, of course. so we are in this kind of fat place uh, and that shows also the clear distinction culturally and ethnically because of course uh, it's a completely separate yeah. language uh, from from the Nordic yeah. language from, from the Nordic Germanic mm-hmm. languages like Swedish or Norwegian and of course very distinct from the mm-hmm. Slavic languages mm-hmm. like Russian it's more Tataric <laughs> influence maybe a little bit but hardly uh, and And, and um, yeah, it, 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 and you mentioned the mm-hmm. Kalevala. Um, I just know it from other experiences. I'm I'm a an, an classical music artist, and Kalevala seems to be very present in today Finland, be it for children, be it even for opera, be it for all kinds of, of use. Yeah. And I remember the, um, uh, uh, so I don't remember the name in Finnish, but the, the dogs Kalevala, which was made for kids as a yeah. comic. Well, Mauri, Mauri, um, yeah. And then as an yeah, opera. Yeah, Mauri Kunnas Kori in Kalevala, Kalevala, the canny in Kalevala. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And so, so the Kalevala seems to be, It's like if the Edda were like that in yeah, in in, right. in Sweden or 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 whatever right. uh, um, whatever national epic story would be so present and I it's very special mm. in Finland I I can I can only say that as much um, so once again this book is not about the classical what you expect Norse magic right. at all and um, it is very typically Finnish and let's let's maybe start you just mentioned the first chapter of the book where Pekka Ervas um called the light of the north and um he was a theosophist right, right? Yeah. and and I, i i didn't know that phrase maybe you can explain that that phrase by helena blavatsky uh, who said the light will come from finland that's it's on the on the <laughs> title page even of your yeah, book, on the uh, cover yeah. um uh, when, when did she say that what, what, what was the occasion when that she would mention that And why did she? Say I think, that? if I remember right, uh, she me- she said that uh, after she had actually read Kalevala, uh, the, the Finnish national epic. He was uh, impressed by it, and uh, he saw high value and a kind of a deep esoteric wisdom in there, and he was inspired by by it. Uh, when it comes to uh, Pekka was um, being the lights of the north. I think this is just something we ourselves like put in the book that um, he uh, matches matches with with him. Um, but uh, where Blavatsky said that it was uh, this uh, one of uh, the close persons she was working with and who met Ervas uh, early. 
early last century, uh, he mentions that uh, that uh, that she and she can tell uh, to uh, to Ervas that uh, Blavatsky Blavatsky told so. And then there is this quote about that when the world becomes so like. Uh, dark and things look so difficult that even theosophists don't know like um, uh, what to do what is this all about then look to the north because light light will come from finland so it, it was in this this kind of a okay. context <laughs> yeah yeah it, it, it's an interesting thing to say actually yeah. right right and um, so it tells a bit about that guy but so he he was He lived roughly 100 years ago, right? So that that's it, the early 1910s, 1920s, mm, yeah. right? He was born 1875 and he died in right, 1934. Back, yeah. uh, he joined the Theosophical Society at uh, a very young age. And, uh, and then after that, he was in very important part also in bringing Finland this Ledroit Humine Freemasonry that also accepts uh, women as members. Okay, so there was, there was yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so yeah, he was exactly. a part, part of bringing yeah, yeah, yeah. to Finland too. He also uh, create, uh, created his own organization, Rosaristi, that could be translated in English as a Rose Cross. Uh, this happened after he uh, <clears throat> get uh, into trouble with the, oh not not he didn't got in trouble but he kind of uh, got got annoyed with the inner schisms of theosophical society and uh, <clears throat> decided to call it call it yeah right. who, who wouldn't <laughs> they back then yeah. exactly the org- org- <laughs> Rudolf Steiner the organization is the same that emphasized <laughs> brotherhood they they had a big problem with the very concept <laughs> they were fighting with each other absolutely yeah. and Ervas yeah. uh, Yes, I said earlier, he was very much Kalevala inspired and uh, politically he was left leaning during those times, but uh, he tried to keep uh, distance to politics and remind also um, others in theosophical society back then when they were these uh, inner fights that uh, hey, 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 that let's remember Blavatsky's original message and concentrate on this brotherhood and bringing this esoteric wisdom to the world and let's not fight with political things. And so, uh, so he was like that. He was very, very uh, influential uh, and very popular an absolutely um, prolific writer. He wrote a lot, uh, a lot, tons of books and articles, and he gave lots of presentations too. And, um, and uh, his books were very well read. And uh, he was very- so, so he was popular beyond the, the, the circles of occultism and theosophy. Yeah, yeah. There were lots of people who tried to get him involved. Uh, to the political uh, activities of the times, like Elf, mm-hmm. of course, like to the leftist yeah. politics. But uh, he was glad to give uh, presentations and talks to uh, people who were involved from that direction. But uh, he, he tried to get a distance to, to politics, although he was clearly left-leaning yeah. himself. And this was an uh, in- interesting right. uh, point that uh, is there in the chapter later in the book, too, that... Uh, Uh, he had this vision and dream, which was part of his vision of the future of, I guess, theosophical, like a worldview in general, that uh, uh, we would have like a, like Europe nowadays, European Union, like a, and he would have been, I guess, pretty happy seeing like a countries uh, not have so strict borders. And he also envisioned like a one currency that we now have in Europe. Back then, it, back, back oh, then, it really? was very yeah, visionary, right. like a hundred years ago. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Interesting. Well, maybe just a little political background. Uh, in Finland, like in many countries, just after the World War, which was roughly also coinciding with the independence in Finland, um, there were struggles between strong left movements and more conservative yeah. movements, uh, like in Germany, for yeah. example, in the in the early 1920s, or in, in several mm-hmm. countries in Europe, of course, especially after the monarchies mm-hmm. broke down. <laughs> and, um, and in Finland, like in also other countries, um, um, in the end, the The, the the conservative wing um, took took the lead, but but it was always a it was quite a quite a heavy fight in the beginning, wasn't it? Yeah, it was um, like a, this kind of things always. It turns ugly, and uh, it was very very ugly here yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, you know, mm. there there were like a, we will yeah. look at the book uh, later. Like there's this chapter about occultism, nationalism in Finland. Uh, we we find yeah, we find exactly. of the figures that were not left leaning, but was very much on the other end of the spectrum. So there's been the whole 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 yeah. spectrum. Yeah. And, uh, whole yeah, spectrum. and uh, yeah. it's uh, not surprising that. Yeah. Uh, we can go back after that maybe let, let's talk about that because it kind of fits mm. well um, uh, that chapter of cultism and nationalist maybe you want to expand a little bit on that because it's an important one isn't yeah it? like um, you know, that's you're right like when it comes to what is like the really finish like a and like um, to this occultism esotericism like a And, and this history in, in Finland, this uh, chapter about occultism and nationalism, I think it's very important. Um, yeah, we have a, we became independent in 1917 and um, uh, being a, for a fairly short, short period, independent nation. And, uh, and of course, like uh, there's been this search for national identity <clears throat> and, uh, and, and, uh, Something like this, like in our position between the East and the West, if you will, uh, it gives its color. And uh, there's been people who've been left-leaning, people who have been more more right-leaning, and uh, and uh, quite many uh, Finnish occultists or esotericists have been quite nationalistic, um, but uh, not not all. Mm. Uh, plenty of people have wanted to stay away from this political thing as much as possible, but. It hasn't been unknown. Like uh, there's been people who's been in, involved uh, openly in, in either left or right leaning way. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I mean, the the fact I think exists in most countries. I would say, but maybe people are less outspoken. I mean, the occultists are less outspoken about that. Uh, they are analyzed to be this or that, but they are less openly manifesting their their political mm. side mm. in occultism. Is that different in, in or was that at the time different in Finland? <laughs> Uh, that's a tough one. Um, I don't know how to compare that. That's but uh, mm, mm, mm -hmm. early last century, of course, there were figures like uh, Sigurd Bettenhovi Aspa, who uh, was more, we could say, on the right right leaning side. Uh, he was a painter, sculptor, writer, um, very famously known kind of pseudo linguist who saw that. Uh, Finland and Finnish people, Finnish language, that uh, we were basically the cr cradle of uh, Western civilization and Finnish language was the root language of <laughs> all languages and all, all of that, like put a bit, and us on a very grand, like a place in the history of the world. And uh, he had this absolutely great okay. book about uh, Kalevalaya Egypti, uh, talking about uh, how uh, Finns were actually like um, living in ancient Egypt and uh, And that uh, how you can see from the, oh, okay. from the Egyptian language that it's clearly like a, um, like a, there's a clear connection to the to the Finnish language and 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 and, and all, uh, uh, I all heard of that. that. That's it, it's a wild <laughs> chapter. Aspa was a very famous figure, and influential in his time, and he had like a friends like Jean Sibelius, the Finnish, uh, famous Finnish Finnish composer. Oh, really? Yeah, and uh, Sibelius yeah. had a kind of. Uh, A warm, humorous approach to Aspas theories and so on. Uh, when he came, uh, gave an interview to the Time magazine once, he kind of uh, warm-heartedly said that uh, when um, he was asked about like a great composers of the past, something like that, he said that uh, well, all the all the great composers lived in Egypt 5,000 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> like that. Okay. Okay. Well, maybe it was Finnish humor then back with Sibelius. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And now let's take our musical break in the middle of this interview, as we always do in this show. And this time the. Uh, the music that we hear is classical. I promise that there will be some classical 
Of course, today, Finnish music. You know me, classical music from time to time. You get it here from me. So this music, well, there is, of course, the one great classical composer in Finland, and that's Jean Sibelius, as he called himself, Jan Sibelius. He uh, wrote lots of interesting music. He was a Freemason as well, and he wrote also uh, Masonic music. And there is one short eight-minute symphonic poem about Finland, which is called Finlandia, with a chorus in the end. Well, you don't always get the chorus. Sometimes it's performed without the singers, but it's so much nicer with the chorus. And Finlandia is, I think, many of you might have heard at least the tunes from it without knowing that it was what it was. So we're now going to hear Jean Zibelius, Jan Zibelius, Finlandia, and after which we will return to our interview with Vesa Iti. And um, after the interview, at the end of the interview, Korpi Klani returned to the show and their other piece, a little bit different in style, they also show you their versatility. This is called Sanaton Ma. Um, don't ask me for the translation. I don't know. Um, so it's now Finlandia by Sibelius. Then after that, we have Vesaiti returning to the show with the second part of that interesting interview on Finland and its occultism. And we will finish with Korpi Klanis Sanaton Ma. Well, not quite finished yet, because of course, then as always afterwards, I'll introduce you to episode number 21 for next week and tell you what will be on next week. Okay, but now let's go to Sibelius Finlandia.
there is a chapter, maybe I'm just exaggerating that, but um, there is a chapter which I found we have to talk about because it talks about uh, Pekka Seaton, <laughs> right? Um, the Archbishop of Lucifer, mm -hmm. he, you call him in the, in, the tit in, the, in the title of that mm -hmm. chapter. But tell us about Pekka Seaton, um, the infernal life of Pekka Seaton. What, what do you mean by that? What happened with him? Who was well, he? His life certainly was infernal. Well, Seton was born in 1994, died 2003. Uh, he was very controversial, uh, very colorful figure. Uh, he mixed politics and occultism uh, in a very interesting way. Um, he um, he was uh, he's known nowadays that uh, he was this uh, very comical neo-Nazi who uh, worshipped the devil in order to like appraise God. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, he founded this, his own society, Turun Hengen Tieteen Seura, kind of a Turku society of spiritual sciences. And uh, in the 70s, early 70s, um, he wrote uh, plenty of books, um, published books. And he was a child of his time when it came to his influences. He was, uh, the, you can find UFOs, uh, uh, anthroposophy, theosophy, this kind of influences. But he created his own kind of mix, mix of things. He kind of created his very unique own kind of uh, occult theory and um, background for everything. He became very infamous um, in the 70s, like uh, not very much about his this, uh, devil worship uh, stuff, but uh, more about his politics because he became like uh, in the 1973 openly a neo-Nazi and uh, he, he and his group, they were not only uh, talking of these things, but they were quite radical. They sent letter bombs and um, thre uh, uh, threats to uh, left-leaning uh, printing houses and places. And the uh, most infamous case was when one of his uh, more mentally unstable follower tried to explode and set on fire this one printing house, uh, communist printing house in in Helsinki, and because of that, he and a few of his um, followers were given prison sentences. After that, uh, well, he continued his uh, political activities, but um, in a much, much more uh, uh, quiet, quiet way. Uh, uh, yeah, he died in in two thousand uh, two thousand three. And uh, being a firm believer in reincarnation, he knew that uh, in his next life, he will be the president of the United States. Okay. <laughs> Okay, well, well, <laughs> let's wait <laughs> what happens there. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Well, he must have been quite, I read the chapter, I mean, it must be indeed a very, a very colorful person, right? Yeah, he right. was. But rather dark, a rather dark color. Yes, so, yes, say, you're right. right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, let's. Uh, we will speak about um, occultism in Finland today uh, later in more detail. But I have one question, which more has to do with language than with um, actual mm -hmm. content, because um, well, many of those big groups like we were mentioning theosophy we i i think also anthroposophy is not weak in finland i think there's quite a strong group in finland as far as i know there is the good jeff group mm -hmm. that you yeah. mentioned there are those classical um, um, orders i don't know is the golden dawn present in finland today is other orders of that type those more ritual magic classical ceremonial magic groups are they do they have local groups? Um, but in many countries, the question of language, of course, is a kind of problem, even in French speaking countries or, or Italy or so, because those texts often come from English and have not been translated well. Um, and well, how do those groups actually do their ritual work? Do they create their own ritual or did they? I mean, not only now, but also in the past. How do they deal with the 
particular Finnish language situation. I think this can be an example of other countries mm-hmm. because this is something that's not a, a, a singular Finnish problem. Yeah. It's a problem that countries with a smaller distributed language always yeah, have. Yeah, that's a good point. I think it's been in the past and uh, nowadays too that... Um, Uh, people in uh, different groups, uh, they basically use both languages, like uh, let's say English and Finnish. Um, it's been quite common that uh, different groups, uh, they translate important uh, English texts into Finnish and uh, sometimes also the other way around. Um, but uh, um, it's been, uh, I've, I've noticed this that uh, Yeah, like uh, if you your your own language is is Finnish, uh, it has a it has kind of a depth and uh, nuances and uh, a kind of exper- experiential dimensions that uh, are easily lacking when you're using English that is not your first language. So, so uh, so uh, sure. yeah, I think that. Uh, Which is true for any foreign language somehow for the <laughs> that's true. Right? So uh, I think that's the reason why uh, why uh, also here, like uh, several groups have been translating. Uh, they have found it important to translate uh, basic texts into Finnish and publish them, like a be it audio or, or whatever, like a te- uh, important texts are translated into Finnish and. Uh, And uh, rituals are done in, in Finnish, uh, if possible, and people create uh, their own rituals and use Finnish to, like, um, I guess English is used, of course, if, if there are guests that I don't speak Finnish or, or so. But, uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's a, that's a good point that uh, people don't just use English, that, uh, if possible, and when possible, they want to want to use Finnish. Yeah. So is, is much of that material, say, for example, in theosophy, translated into into Finnish? Yeah. Yeah. Like uh, Blavatsky's works, uh, you can find them in Finnish. Of course, Erwas wrote in, 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 in Finnish. Some, some of, some, some of, some of course, his most yes, important yes. books have been translated into English and I think Swedish too. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Your book um, has 15 chapters, so basically 15 movements or 15 important names um, or a mix of mm-hmm. them are are. are pointed out there as examples. Um, of course, we are not going to talk about mm-hmm. all of them. A, this is not mm-hmm. time, but also uh, we want people to read the book and not tell them everything <laughs> yeah. about it. But um, um, there, there is, of course, one book I, if you don't mind, I would like to, I, one chapter I, if you don't mind, want to have you uh, expand a little bit more, which is the Jodiev Uh, um, history in Finland because you're an expert on that. So, um, how did the Gurdjieff movement come into into Finland? What, how did it develop there, and what does it mean today in your country? All right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, um, the chapter two, uh, Gurdjieff and Stiernbals, it tells about the um, story of uh, this uh, noble family of uh, Leonid, Elisabetta. Stiernball and their son Nikolai Stiernball, uh, whose biological father was Gurdjieff. Mm. Um, they, uh, oh, really? yeah, yeah, yeah. There's an yeah. yeah. in- yeah. interesting yeah. story yeah. about that told in the book. But uh, they um, they mm-hmm. were part of Gurdjieff, um, like Saint Petersburg group uh, in the in the very beginning when Gurdjieff started to have groups, groups, you know, groups there and. Uh, Uh, especially Leonid, he was very, very, there are mentions that he was uh, almost a fanatical follower of Gurdjieff. Uh, his wife, Elisabetta, was not that much uh, like so enthusiastic, but uh, she's hanging, she hung in there too. And uh, they were uh, part of the whole exodus when the people from, uh, um, from uh, St. Petersburg uh, left. Their, their political situation came what came 
and they started the exodus through uh, through Europe uh, and uh, finally ending, of course, in France and where the uh, this, uh, Institute for the Harmonious Development of Man was established. They were with, with Gurdjieff yeah. uh, through all that uh, time and uh, experienced all those things. Um, and Nik- Nikolai Stjernvall, uh, the son, uh, he wrote a fantastic memoir, uh, my my father, my dear father Kurjev, where he uh, recounts these things with his mother too. And uh, this is like a, where the first uh, first things involved with Kurjev movement uh, are, like um, at, at the very time. And uh, af- after that. Um, what can be said with certainty, like the late 60s, there came, uh, there came people uh, in, involved who started to have run groups and uh, start to publish in Finnish uh, texts, like uh, B.D. Uspensky's Psychology of Man's Possible Evolution was the first book. Uh, I was going to ask if yeah. Uspensky had also yeah. a, a role to yeah, play there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uspensky and a good shift. There is a, in Uspensky, this uh, In Search of the Mir- Miraculous, there is this famous uh, incident where uh, Uspensky tells that uh, he had a telepathic uh, communication with Gurdjieff. Uh, that happened in, uh, in in Finland back then. Yeah, I oh, really? think I think it was... Uh, okay. Now, if you look at the map, that was probably on the Russian side by our, like, a today's maps. But, uh, but uh, back then, it was still part of, of, of Finland. Um Yeah, in the 60s, there started to be um, clear activities too, and they started to publish books. Those people were um, very much influenced by this uh, British uh, uh, pupil of Gurdjieff, this uh, um, Bennett, uh, G.J. Bennett. And, uh, and uh, they, uh, they were Finns who went to the UK to his uh, so-called seminar, and um, took part to the study groups there and uh, translated Bennett's book into Finnish. And uh, that, uh, that group uh, continued till uh, around mid, mid-80s when this uh, Baino Kopponen, who was the founder of that uh, group, uh, died. And uh, that was pretty much the uh, end of this, uh, this phase. After that, there was some uh, pause and uh, in 2001, Uh, Gurdjieff groups kind of uh, activated again in Finland when um, um, we got uh, a contact here with this um, um, one man whose whose own teacher was uh, uh, was had been in, in, in a contact with Gurdjieff and uh, he had authorized him to continue the work and start groups and so so his pu- pupil. Uh, Uh, got into contact uh, with Finland and Finnish people involved and, uh, uh, and uh, new groups were founded in Helsinki and Turku area, later also elsewhere. And after that, there's been uh, groups, especially in Turku and Helsinki, but also also elsewhere. And the activities are, well, pretty typical activities of Gurdjieff groups. There are uh, local meetings, um, There are the uh, work weekends and uh, all, all kinds of uh, movements and uh, all, all, all these things. Uh, so the number of the people involved is not very high, but uh, but that's um, pretty much the same in many other countries too. But uh, mm. people, I was going yeah. to say that's an international yeah, matter. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. but but uh, but there's serious uh, involvement and, uh, and work being done on that front. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Um, we were mentioning earlier the the ethical background. Kalevala, of course, mm. came back uh, often. But um, uh, what about if any role does the Sami ethnical group and uh, background in the north of Finland play in occultism in Finland? Because I believe they have a very particular, also partly shamanic um, background, mm-hmm. if I'm not wrong. Um, but does this have any... Uh, so the, the Laponia, to be clear, to mm-hmm. those people who don't know the word Sami baby in in, in, in North mm-hmm. America, um, do, do does these people have uh, their own 
maybe the word occultism is a bit uh, mm -hmm. wrong there, but do they have their own approach to things supernatural and uh, mystic? Mm. Um, you, you're not the first person to, to ask this question. This uh, clearly interests, uh, of, is of interest to many. Um, when one reads through our book, uh, this Sami connection, North Finland connection to people involved with our story and the people involved is a it's uh, surprisingly lacking it's not very strongly present there um, we could we, we could uh, yes. <laughs> it's, a, it's a kind of a <laughs> that's what I was asking <laughs> it's a kind of a, a totally isolated pocket it's like um, Sami people and their kind of shamanistic worldview uh, it's uh, I think like um, after Finland became a Christian nation and um, Sami people's like uh, shamanistic beliefs became suppressed and so it's it's still tough to take this kind of cultural elements completely away and uh, and I think there's at least as an undercurrent uh, in up in up in the north uh, it, it, I think it can be still found here and there and there are people who experienced something something like that you know, as part of their um, spiritual reality but uh but when it comes to our book this dimension the sami sami connection to finnish occultism esotericism is is um, it's not there it's a uh, it's totally yeah. it's not there um, maybe the or not maybe but it is there when we come to the, the neo-paganism and the, and the kind of uh, this kind of um, nature uh, nature uh, groups nowadays um, and there are there are few few of them yeah. they are quite uh, quite popular I would say and uh, there are people involved with them there we can find people who uh, are seriously involved also in the Sami tradition and uh, well shamanism in general and mm -hmm. and that and I think that's the that's mm -hmm. the strongest angle to to Sami people and uh, yeah. uh, and northern part of Finland. Uh, okay, but uh, but but any Sami account, like for example the Kalevala for the the the, the, the Finnish people in general, um, does not have the same. It, it, there is not the same kind of um, epic story or so in the Sami tradition that would have an influence in today's occultism, right? There, well, if we look at the folkloristic materials and stories and what has been recorded, there's um, there there are uh, of course text and history and so but there is nothing like um, one book like Kalevala uh, interestingly Kalevala, Kalevala that was collected uh, from the eastern part of Finland where this uh, runo, runo singers yes. Yes. were um, well telling these stories and uh, from and that, that's Karelia yes, mostly yes. No? And, uh, that, that's, uh, that area was more about kind of a verbal magic uh, kind of a uh, spells and certain kind of verbal formulas using this kind of ways for magic it was a kind of a combination of a kind of shamanistic undercurrent with a verbal magic verbal formulas uh, in the north it was clearly then shamanistic and uh, not so much like a verbal magic so Kalevala uh, rep represents more yes. of this eastern verbal magic Mm -hmm. approach although there is um, you can clearly see this kind of uh, also shamanistic uh, nature yeah. emphasizing dimension yeah yeah, yeah. Um, you have we have spoken so much about Kalevala do you have a suggestion for our listeners for a good English translation into Kalevala which they could or should read to to understand uh, Kalevala and to, to, to get to the to the point of it to get down on it uh, i can i can't recommend just some one specific uh, translation or edition um, I, i would uh, if i would be interested and i hope many will get interested because it's a great book <laughs> uh, to uh, it but, is it? well maybe you just uh, search from amazon or somewhere like a uh, kalevala and see like what kind of editions there are and what kind of reviews they've got mm. and, and what kind of like, um, academic yeah. credentials there are between the people who have uh, edited them or or so forth and pick, pick what looks the mm. best there are there are different kind of um, works um, about the book and and um, editions, but um, yeah, it's yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I will I will post in the show notes maybe a link to Amazon with the right spelling of Kalevala so that people <laughs> don't have to tr have trouble yeah, with yeah. that. Um, as we were just speaking about the far north, of course, now we have to, I can't go around that, talk about your chapter on um, Gaukoniemen uh, because he, he was called the Santa Claus of Kulos Sari. Now, um, Santa Claus, that's why I'm talking about far north, but then when you hear Kulos Sari and no Finland a bit, Kulos Sari is a part of Helsinki, not exactly Correct. far north. Um, but, uh, so, um, well, tell, tell us about Kauko. Kauko Niemen, uh, Mar Notar. He was um, born 1929, died 2010. He was, um, you could say, local eccentric. He wrote quite a bit, uh, self-published uh, many, many pamphlets. He's known for his uh, theory of ether. Ether is uh, uh, this uh, mm. basic ontological substance at the at the bottom of everything. He uh, this was, of course. Uh, popular still like uh, in the in the late um, 18th uh, late 19th century early 20th century and uh, then came uh, Einstein and the whole theory of ether went into the trash bin of history but uh, some occultists and esotericists of course were still interested uh, the whole concept that there is something in that. Uh, Niemine was one of those who thought that yeah, there is there is substance in this, and uh, he he wrote about that passionately and talked about it to anybody willing to listen. Uh, he had a um, he had done studies uh, at the university. He was very very uh, keen on taking part to a scientific. Um, uh, groups and uh, all kind of um, events of scientific nature, but uh, but uh, he was um, more than that. He was um, kind of um, eccentric occultist in his uh, own right, and uh, he was. Um, people generally take him with humor, but uh, he was uh, considered kind of with a warm way that he was a very nice nice person down to earth easy to approach people loved him and because of his looks like a, he looked like a, either the Vainamoinen the main main hero of Kalevala or Santa Claus so uh, there, there there came this nickname for him that he is the Santa Claus of Kulosa <laughs> uh, did, did he live yes he did he lived uh, at, I think it, it was with uh, his parents like uh, for a long, long time, yeah. Thing. Okay, because he was initially, if I'm not wrong, he was from Kuop, you're right, from the East. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, interesting. Um, well, let's go finally to the to the light bringers today and mm -hmm. called the last yeah. chapter in your book. So um, we spoke briefly about maybe the more popular side or culture side of occultism in Finland nowadays and and you mentioned that briefly in the beginning so I think we had mm. that but um, where does occultism as opposed to occulture so the group work the solitary work people like uh, today's so to speak today's uh, um, what is around there what do you see today in Finland as a development where does it go how how does it all look today and do you have a, an out view on that yeah um, of course now when the internet arrived, the, the world has become smaller in a way and uh, all kind of information is available to anybody with the press of a button. Same thing here and uh, that has affected of course the um, occult culture and the landscape and the groups in Finland. Finland too, that had affected a lot. Um, when it comes to the groups, uh, well, we have Freemasons here. And they have their history. They are, of course, like in um, in Europe, elsewhere, and in the States, they are, they have quite much members, and uh, they have also lots of uh, members who are in uh, positions of power, either politically or otherwise, or both. Um, spiritualism, uh, spiritualist groups are here. Theosophy is still here, although the average age of uh, 
theosophists in Finland is pretty high, and it looks like they are they are a bit of a, having a problem finding uh, younger members. But uh, they it sounds like an international problem with yeah, 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 you're right. Mm. In Finland, we have this yeah. funny angle that. Uh, uh, the direction where theosophy has got, uh, I guess, I can't say most, but uh, some some uh, a new interest. It's uh, it's from the left hand path side. There is this very Finnish organization called the Star of Azazel, Azazel in Dahti. They are left. They are a left hand okay. path organization, but uh, at least their founder who has uh, written uh, quite a bit uh, books and so. Is Johannes Nefastos. Uh, he has got a huge influence from theosophy uh, in his uh, in his oh, really? view, and uh, he is also like uh, being emphasizing in his writings, like uh, also like a uh, sermon of the mount, like a uh, Jesus teachings, and and so so it's an uh, interesting interesting new and very Finnish uh, organization that has also like uh, take a fresh look at theosophical. Idea. So there are some new interesting uh, developments that has partly their root in theosophy. Then there is, of course, the um, Pekka Ervast, uh, Rusurist is still there, and Anthroposophy too. Those that these groups are not uh, nowhere as big as they were hundred years ago, but uh, they are still there. And then there are uh, these uh, neo pagan groups. Groups. Uh, most important of them uh, are. Um, Lehto and Bakanaverko, um, and there are other groups too, um, different kind of groups for different kind of like uh, animals. And uh, then there are people like uh, Aki Sederberg, who uh, was also published by Inner Traditions. Uh, his book, His Journeys in the Kali Yuga, offers a very interesting angle to. Uh, Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I think I I spoke to him at some point. Absolutely, I'll yeah, be, he's, he's a, that. yeah, a great guy with very interesting uh, take on on these topics. Uh, and uh, then there is this uh, left hand path uh, or Satanist uh, uh, group groups. There is. Uh, I think the Temple of Set is still in Finland, and there is the Star of Azazel, and then there is this infamous Black Order of Pan-Europe, and uh, one of the newer groups is a group called Perkelen Temple, which basically reminds me of this uh, uh, this American uh, American group that uh, had been like uh, doing legal battle about uh, basically the freedom of speech and, and, all, and all of that. So they are very, mm -hmm. very uh, kind of, you would say, humanistic in their in their viewpoint. Uh, we have OTO. Or the Temple Orient is, is, is in Finland to the Gurdjieff yeah. Society, Gnostic Society. Uh, something in addition to these groups that is covered in the last chapter is uh, we we covered uh, what kind of a podcasts, publications, uh, and a publishers. Yeah. These kind of things um, have been like a present in in the country. and and that is quite an amazing that is quite an amazing bunch of people yeah. for. Well, uh, how many people live in Finland? Six million? <laughs> not even. I, not I quite, think it's right? less. It's like uh, somewhere between five and five and a half and six million nowadays. Mm. More yeah, close to exactly. five. Exactly. So I mean, uh, that that is quite amazing. I mean, the the, the, the occult life seems quite yes. active. Yeah, right? that, yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You are you're right. You said earlier, like uh, that there there are. Um, there's interest and there are books and uh, all of that when it comes to like a, in general like a, a Nordic Nordic things Nordic mythology rune magic all of this but uh, this uh, Finnish mm -hmm. animal uh, it's something else it's uh, it, it's something else and this is a kind of a, it's been an empty empty, empty spot uh, before because there's no being a book like our book before so this maybe this uh, answers some kind of need uh, for people who are interested in um, what, what is in here in, in addition to this uh, Nordic uh, approaches that people are familiar with already exactly no I think that's a very important pain 
point you're making here towards the end of our talk. And I, I want to say that clearly, again, this is not just a book about a country and what they do there mm -hmm. um, but it's it's very particular it's very particular through a very particular culture which is the Finnish culture which is the Finnish historical background we mentioned mm -hmm. also that briefly and that all together makes it up more than just an account of 10 or 15 interesting <laughs> people and their groups but it's it's much more than that it's it's an in-depth story um, let yourself fall into the story of Finland and live it with that book mm -hmm. a little bit in the occult story of Finland and um, let them bring the light like uh, Mrs. Blavatsky <laughs> said and let them bring the light to at least you and you as a reader I think it's really it's really uh, very very nice and important book and thank you for that and um, Vesa um, before I let you go and thank you for your time but before I let you go um is there any personal plans in that field in the publishing field maybe in in the occult field that you have anything that we should be on the lookout maybe not in finnish language it will be a minority who can read that maybe but something in english that we can expect from you in the near or not so near future uh, right now i don't have a like a any specific plans um, in my in my books but uh, I've said it before like I all right I, I I have a little break now from my writing and translate translating but uh lo and behold it doesn't take too long and I'm up into something again <laughs> so uh, I might end up writing or yeah. translating something again fairly soon but uh, I don't know right now um, I've decided to uh, I have a Uh, I, I will concentrate on some other things a little bit more, but uh, well, I, I love uh, writing and translating, so I'm fairly sure at some point I'll be back uh, doing something. Okay, well, we'll be on the lookout. Uh, you won't escape. Veza <laughs> Iti, so, uh, thank you very much for your time here today and uh, for a fascinating talk. Um, all the best. Uh, um, is it still is it still light now? Now it's quarter to midnight uh, where you are now. And I think the midnight sun. Are you in the south or in the north? Uh, I'm in south. Tur Turku is uh, very uh, southwest. Turku, yeah. yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, sure. So, there the sun has already set now uh, even now in the middle in, 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 in it's actually July. pretty light it's pretty light it's a uh, it's not it dark still, at all <laughs> it's still. ah okay well well then have a wonderful dawn mm. or whatever you would like to call thank, it thank you yeah, uh, yeah, thank yeah. you uh, for uh, having this chance of being in your great great show and your podcast is absolutely fantastic Well, that's very kind. Thank you, Veza, and um, have a good have a good time. And moi moi, <laughs> as you say. Moi moi. <laughs>
the gang from the backwood, the clan from the backwood, Korpi Klani, and their song Sanaton Ma. And that was my interview with Vesaiti on Lightbringers of the North, the new book that was released this week by Inner Traditions and which told us all about Finnish occultism. And I hope all of you have now understood that this is not just some remote little thing. This is really interesting and you should have a look at it. It's really worth it. So thanks to everyone who contributed to this show and thanks to you, the listeners, who were listening to it because we could all contribute. If you were not listening it, hmm, bad. You know, art only exists because people listen or look at it. That's the definition or one of the possible definitions of art. Right. So let's do art again next week. So come back next week and listen to my show next week to episode number 21, which will be released on July the 24th. And it's a returner again. It's somebody who was already on the show, but this time with a completely different topic. Um, Richard Gavin, the great Richard Gavin, well, very well-known author of weird fiction and great guy and interesting guy who was already on the show, um, I believe, a year and a half or so ago. Um, after that big interval, big break that I did in not producing any shows for several months, he was the first to come back and now Richard Gavin is here on a new interview but this time it's about non-fiction he it's his second book that he publishes with Theon Publishing that great Munich based publisher run by Jessica Grote and David Beth I'm not going to tell you more because we're talking about that next week so do come back and listen to my talk with Richard Gavin on his new non-fiction book right and until then, I hope you are all going to have a great week. Stay safe, be careful, look forward to having you back next week, and uh, take care, stay tuned, hear you soon.